don't think it's a secret to anyone on the committee that this is a priority <laughs> issue of Main Street Alliance. Um, we, for those of you who aren't that familiar with us, we're um, a small business public policy organization. We have about 600 members statewide. Um, and this is an issue that we've been working on with our members for a number of years now. We, um, we see it not just as a support to the workforce, but really to small business owners in general. Um, we think of it as something that we can do as a state to set us apart from other states because as of right now, there are only um, six states, well, five states in Washington, D.C. that have programs. We think it could really be a way for us to kind of differ differentiate ourselves as a state that um, is family friendly and you know passes policies that are supportive of businesses and the workforce in tandem. And so um, we are in full support of the uh, legislature creating a program. We think that, um, as everyone knows at this point, that we're a small business state. The majority of businesses have fewer than 20 employees, and they employ a significant percentage of, of workers in the state at roughly 32%. Um, and so when we think about policies like this, it's, um, from our perspective, it's a way to help business owners compete because most of our members, most small business owners that we talk to, they don't provide this benefit, not because they don't believe in it or see that it's a need or that it's essential or important, but because it's just not something that they can afford in their own policy um, to have someone out for a number of weeks um, and also in some cases have to pay to replace someone, it can be really financially challenging. So they see this as a way for the state to kind of fill in that gap between what, what workers need and what business owners can offer. So that's why as an organization, we're fully in support of creating a family medical leave insurance program. Um, we also, I just wanna um, draw your attention to our survey results. We, um, I think, Lindsay or someone has come in before and, and spoken about our um, our small business survey that we do, and I brought a couple um, reports here if anyone would like one to reference. We um, so obviously our members and our leadership support is, are in full support of family leave, but we also have um, surveyed Main Street business owners, members and non-members around the state about this issue, and um, we found strong support for it as well. We have um, the survey. May I just ask a question? Uh, yes, Senator Clarkson. Um, Ashley, the it, it doesn't it, it does say that you uh, surveyed businesses in all fourteen counties. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a notion of how many businesses? Oh yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't include that. It's seven hundred eighty-one. Wow. Um, and so all counties are represented, although not clearly every. Um, Every county has a different number of businesses, and so they weren't necessarily yeah. equally, equal distribution, but they were all represented. 86% of those surveyed had fewer than 10 employees, and the majority surveyed owned retail, and the second um, largest group surveyed were food service and restaurant establishments. And so we found that 63.5% um, of those surveyed were in support of the state creating a program. And I should also note that um, the, we asked those who were surveyed whether or not they were a member of MSA, and 9.5% were. So this is mainly a non-member survey. Uh, sorry, did it help you get more members? <laughs> yes, it does always help to do the survey to get more members. Um, we found also that, so we also, not aside from just surveying about whether or not people were supportive of the concept of family leave in general, we also surveyed about how um, people think it should be funded or how many weeks and things of that nature and so most of the uh, members who were surveyed expressed a preference for shared funding divided between employers and employees it was 51 percent and then only eight percent indicated a preference for employee only funding though I will think it's really important to note that uh, 40 percent of them said they didn't know or chose not to answer so um, Clearly, there was no preference with a, with a significant number of those surveyed. We also um, asked about the duration of leave. We gave two options for eight or 12 weeks, and there was um, roughly twice as many business owners indicated a preference for 12 weeks than indicated a preference for eight weeks, but um, fewer, ref fewer respondents expressed a preference than those did not. So um, there were clearly some questions about this that people didn't really feel they had strong leanings towards either way. 
but overall we found very strong support amongst the small business community. So I think that since, as you all know, the bill that passed the House changed significantly from the way it was introduced, and I know the committee hasn't really had a lot of time to discuss exactly the direction of where you want to go, things you want to change. So I was thinking that um, it would make the most sense for me to kind of run through different components of the bill and what pieces we were um, strongly advocating for and why, and just kind of giving a sense of what we as an organization and also a member of the Family Medical Leave Coalition would like to see moving forward, recognizing that we obviously it may not be feasible to, to restore a lot of the components I, of the bill. I have a couple of questions. Who are the members of the coalition? Can you get us a list of I can give you, yep, I can give you a list. And also, um, I want to thank you for this memo because this is exactly terrific. what we need to see all the variables, and there are many in a, in a paid lead. Yes. Of legislation. I would ask you to expand the chart on page four to show where those variables were in as it came out of the general committee versus introduced, mm -hmm. and I don't know if there's, were there any changes made by the appropriations committee at all? So, the, I know the change, the only change, the, sub, the only substantive change from general was the funding change. So, oh, in appropriations? Um, in general. When the bill moved okay. from general okay. to the ways and means, okay. they changed the funding to employee E only, and then the majority of the other changes were for ways and means. And did, were there any changes in the appropriation? I, I can't recall any significant changes, well, but I'll look back. Yeah. It was mostly ways Absolutely. and means work. Mostly yeah, right. it was almost was all the, the in the Ways and Means Committee. Okay. Ashley, were you surprised in your survey that only 8% of the businesses indicated the preference for an employee-only funding? I wasn't entirely surprised, actually, because I think, um, I think that a lot of business owners see this as something that employees should contribute to because it is a direct benefit to them, but I think um, they also feel like it's a support for small business and so it makes sense for it to be shared, I suppose. That's at least been the conversations that I've had with folks. Um, but I'm not, I'm not entirely surprised that people didn't think it, sh it should, a significant number didn't think it should be. That's a good question. I mean, could you, um, and maybe, is Legislative Council here? No. No. I'm sure they know the bill backwards and forwards, but uh, yeah, I think they do. Um, could you work with legislative council? And I, it's a good question, and I think probably I would imagine that empl employers um, most of them took the position that there should be some contribution from employers because I think in almost virtually all payroll stuff related to work, there is some employer contribution. And I would like to get sort of a list of all the you know, benefits, All the benefits are out there, and, and which yeah. ones are shared, which are, most of them are fully paid by the employer, uh, you know, but which ones are shared and which one, and if there are some right. that are, I, mean, I don't know too many where we say to the employee pay everything. We've got this new one that we passed last year where you can do a, a, a for people who don't have pensions, yeah. retirement plans. Public pension, you can, you public can retirement. You can set money aside right. on your own. Yeah. But it'd be good to see the kinds of benefits that are Fully paid by employer, fully paid by employee, mm -hmm. and the ones that are shared. Thank you. Yeah, that would be a good question. I know, I mean, tempor when businesses offer temporary disability insurance, that tends to be a shared cost. Um, but yeah, I, I, that would be interesting. I'll write this down and make sure to get that information. Um, well, yes. may I just add, I mean, I, I also think it makes some sense. I can see why an employer would want uh, to contribute, because e even if it isn't equally matched or just in part, because uh, em employees that are able to have the flexibility to turn to something that is uh, a huge distraction and is a, a huge challenge in their family life yeah. are happier employers, uh, employees, and are probably more productive and probably retained for longer. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that if, I think that this is not, this is like a, but you said you can ask sense. all the questions you want. <laughs> yeah, and I think well, thanks too, a lot. Um, you don't know how tough I am when you're out of the room. <laughs> you're out of the room. Um, and I think too that most of the people that we've talked to have 
like I said, wanted to provide some type of benefit, but can't. If, if you have a minimum wage worker out for 12 weeks, it's just, I think I did the math recently, it's just under $6,000 to have that person out. And then if you're gonna replace them with someone else, it's pre-tax. Um, then that can be incredibly costly. But if you're paying a small percentage of the insurance fund, it's generally, depending on the business, obviously less expensive. And so I think that's where the, the reasoning behind the, the support for joint funding came from. Um, so, oh, and I also have copies of the survey, which isn't just family leave, it's multiple issues if anyone would like them. Um, I know you. <laughs> I, you know, I, anyway, I will tell you later about my latest survey. Right <laughs> I look forward to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so. <laughs> I look forward to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I'll walk through. Um, okay. As I said before, we, before the bill was introduced in the house, we worked with our members and leaders and our board, and. Uh, organizational partners in the Family Leave Coalition to, and House leader and House uh, lead sponsors to identify what do we think are the ideal components of a paid family leave program, and so those were reflected in the way the bill was introduced: 12 weeks, 100% wage replacement, joint funding, um, and I'm trying to think of what the uh, job protection, um, non-restrictive eligibility, and allowing self-employed to obtain coverage. And so when the bill was diminished in the House, you know, we're trying to kind of regroup and figure out what are your priorities as a committee and what are ours. And so I didn't necessarily narrow these down into, um, you know, what are, what are the number, the top three things we would like to change, but I wanted to just walk through and go through our rationale for each and then um, what we would recommend in an ideal world. Um, so the number of weeks in the, the bill as introduced was 12, and as you know, now it's six. We were recommending 12 weeks because research will show that 12 weeks of leave particularly related to um, bonding with a new child is essential for not only maternal and child health, but um, to make sure that uh, children have proper checkups and vaccinations and routine healthcare appointments and things. Um, and in fact, I thought this was important to note that the um, experts, including the American Academy of Pediatri Pediatrics, recommend that um, infants shouldn't be enrolled in childcare until 12 weeks. So we see this issue is also intersecting with the childcare issue that we know, mm -hmm. you know, not just in this way, but also that childcare, you know, it's hard to access for infants, and it's more it's, mm -hmm. infant care is really expensive. So if we're allowing parents to stay home for 12 weeks, then we could also potentially have impacts positive impacts on the child care system. Um, we also, um, current unpaid federal, current state law, the Vermont Parental and Family Leave Act, um, it allows for pay, taking up to 12 weeks unpaid. And so the part of the way that the bill was structured as it was introduced was to really take existing law and create this program that runs concurrently and make it paid and to try to make it simpler and easier. And so that was another reason for 12 weeks. Um, and I rec recognize that the committee moving forward may not, you know, may, may have to make some decisions about whether or not it makes sense to move the weeks up. And so as an organization and part of the Family Leave Coalition, we would love to see 12 weeks, um, if, if at all possible. Oh, I don't need to. <laughs> Man to the chair. Uh, I'm just curious, what was the biggest rationale for the, in, in the house for taking it down to six? So my perception of from being in the Ways and Means Committee for why nearly all of the changes were made were to just create a smaller, cheaper program. Um, I think it also had to do with uh, Representative Ansel's. Uh, Personal predilection. Yes, thank you. I like the use of predilection. Okay, that answers mm -hmm. it. Um, so because it came out of House General at twelve weeks. Didn't yep, it? it came out of House General with everything intact except for the funding mechanism was changed to employee only, and then in Ways and Means there was an amendment. Um, base or amendment. Well, Ways and Means to the future map. Yeah, I mean, so it was a significant lost. number of things were changed. 
Uh, there, is there testimony from businesses who are concerned on what this will do to their operation? Um, I can look that up. I can say that, I mean, we brought in a lot of business owners from various parts of the state to testify in support, and I do believe there were a few um, representatives of business groups and maybe one or two businesses that came in and expressed concerns, but I'll look that up and then um, and then get that up to you. I see an interplay between our emergency responder bill and this bill. Maybe the emergency. So someone can, someone can leave for one hour versus someone can leave for 12 weeks? <laughs> no, no, but maybe it's you very have emergency responders. You, you're right. I, I, again, but I yeah, look forward uh, uh, to that. It's all how you frame it. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, also, so one of the other, the most significant things that changed in the bill was that the ability to use leave for your own illness or injury was removed, which was a very um, unanticipated change. And I will say that if, if, the, if the bill passes um, into law without allowing for care for your own illness or injury, we would be the only state to right. do that. Um, most other states, in fact, actually started with state temporary disability insurance programs, which would allow people to take time off for their own illness or injury or to recover from childbirth. And then they just expanded them to include bonding leave for any parent um, because those programs were so successful. And so we would definitely be a, an outlier if we were to remove yeah. leave for that purpose. Yeah. Can I ask, as, as the bill left general, um, you could use it for your own illness. Mm -hmm. So um, how did that interact with the sick leave? So I don't Thank think, I mean, they're not necessarily related because paid sick leave is part of an employer's policy and it's just for a couple of days if you're, yep. you know, you have a common cold or something of that nature, but then temporary disability insurance is like, um, you would be, it's a state administered program, you would apply, you would receive benefits if you're out for, say if I was in a serious car accident and I was in the hospital for six weeks, then I could get a certain number of wage, level of wage replacement during that time. So Sorry, something I, of that nature. I did sort of not do that when I was out there. Um, so... Okay, it's down to the mighty three. <laughs> the dream team. Well, good. <laughs> Um, so we strongly and, and sorry, again. Yep. I just have to ask, given it's sort of an uh, odd choice to yeah. remove that. What was the rationale in yeah. ways and means? Given it had nothing to do with the um, financing this. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would I would definitely defer to. I would I would recommend that talking to the committee to get the exact rationale, but it's it was. <laughs> it was um, potentially related to cutting costs right, of the right. program. So who reported it on the floor for Ways and Means? It was Representative Till, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah. I'll uh, really? double check. I believe it I'll was. I'll get you that answer. Seems hard. Yeah, I'm almost, I'm almost hard hard certain hard. it was. It makes no sense. Um, <laughs> it's the straight face. Yeah. I think the same if, time. if we're both thinking that, it, we must be yeah, um, so. He did it with his hand behind his back. <laughs> well, I okay. think if we'll if, find out. if I had to choose we'll get him. one thing that we fix in the bill, it would be to ensure that we have leave for that purpose because we want to make sure that it's a comprehensive program that's available to everyone yeah. during various challenging life events, not just birth of a new child or caring for an aging parent, but yeah. also for your own mm -hmm. unexpected illness or injury. Um, so moving on to wage replacement, as the bill was introduced, it was 100% rate wage replacement, now it's 80, which we still fully support. Um, the This is actually one of the most generous wage replacement levels of other states, and so at we're 80 it is. at 80, and, um, and in fact, when we hear, sometimes we hear concerns that these programs are not accessible to low-wage workers, but in if you look at research from other states, it shows that the main reason, one of the main reasons that um, low-wage workers don't take advantage of this program is because the wage replacement is so low. In some states, it's... Um, I think it's New Jersey, I forget which state, but one has like 55% wage replacement, 166, and so if you're a minimum wage worker, obviously it's gonna be really challenging for you to take 12 weeks off at half of your salary or roughly half of your salary. 
So we recommend keeping it as strong as possible, at least 80%. And um, for the job protection piece, as the bill was introduced, it extended job protection to employees of employers of all sizes. And in ways and means, it was amended to, um, it was amended to be consistent with current law in that you um, wouldn't have to hold an employee's job if you um, have 10 or fewer employees. And so we, I think that oftentimes with policies like this, we think that by creating small business exemptions or thresholds that we're actually helping small business and our members in particular prefer simple minimum standards as opposed to business exemptions. And so we would recommend extending job protection um, to employees of employers of all sizes. And I know the chair had, in his bill, he had recommended um, a preference in hiring for employers with, I think it was four or fewer employees, so that if you, you don't necessarily have to hold their job, but when you, they, when you have a first job opening, then you would have, you would offer it to that person. Um, and so, sort you know, of like a right of first refusal. Yeah, essentially, um, which I think is a creative solution as well. So can we just clarify, when this left, the House General, yep. it had full job protection, yes. no qualifiers for size of business. Full job protection, yes, yeah, to everyone. And current unpaid law has um, the 10 employee threshold exemption. Um, but so, this is not unpaid. Right, this is not. And so, right, and we wouldn't, we don't as an organization think that, we don't believe in small business carve outs, and so um, we would absolutely recommend that the committee ins extend job protection to all employees. Um, and so for eligibility requirements, the, this is an important issue for a number of members on the Family and Medical Leave Coalition. The way that the bill was introduced, it, you would be eligible if you had worked six out of the last 12 months continuously and um, and then as it passed ways and means it was amended to be 12 out of the last 13 months which um, we feel and a lot of members on the family leave coalition feel is is too restrictive because there are a lot of people who are working consistently but they have um, you know maybe they work 11 months out of the year or maybe I think home care workers were an example of, of um, folks with the regular schedules and so we want to make sure that people who are consistently working and paying into the program are able to access it. Um, so we would recommend either moving back to the, the eligibility of work, having worked six of the last 12 months or um, choosing another mechanism such as the one that was recommended in the study committee report of, of you have earned a certain base wage. Um, well, excuse me. Why would you advocate something that's below minimum wage for the... Well, so this was just referencing what was in the study committee report at the time, which that was the minimum wage at the time. Um, but obviously these numbers would be different. I was just referencing what was in the, yeah. in the report. Um, but some type of hourly requirement, um, base wage requirement, is some other states do that. California has a really low base wage requirement for eligibility. Um, but we just want to make sure that it's more accessible. Um, and then, okay, I'm wrapping up here. I feel like I'm taking up a lot of your time. Oh, this so, is, this is what you're doing. <laughs> I know, for, I know. Right? Take up our time. All the, I know. We need the details. Um, so, self employed access. We, nearly every state that has a program, allows people who are self employed yeah. to opt in if they choose. Yeah. This was something that was in the bill as it was introduced, and then it was taken out in ways and means. Um, and we feel very strongly that as the nature of employment continues to shift in Vermont and across the nation that we should um, make yeah. sure that we have these essential supports. We're consistently talking about you know, independent contractors and not having access to essential employee benefits and so if we have the opportunity to allow that then we think we should um, extend that and we have a lot of members who are self-employed as well. So. So, so I hate to ask the obvious but it does strike one that if one is self-employed, you can mm -hmm. just do this. Right, I think, yeah. And your income is dependent on your own generation. Yes. And so there's, I mean. I think, so. What is what the thinking behind? What we've heard from some of our self-employed members is that particularly in instances of unexpected illness or injury, um, should they have to stop working and, and 
bringing in an income that this may be something that they would want to participate in. Um, so it's basically insuring themselves yeah, for their own essentially this, their own injury would be the thing that would be key for them. Here. Yes. If you took that out, it would make sense that you would take out the self-employed. Yeah, I think I mean I think I've heard mixed reviews. I can think of a woman who is a new mom who owns her own business and has no employees and feels that this is something that she would want to partake in as like a a future parent. And so um, I think it just depends on the person, but most of the people I've heard from have wanted it to be, wanted it specifically for medical leave purposes. Um, and I'm happy to get information from other states too if you think it would be helpful about how they make manage this. It would be great, because you, you said that there are, um, there are only six other states, uh, there are seven jurisdictions, yes. DC and six states, and it would be great to see a, a, a little chart of what each state does on each of these provisions. I'm yeah, I did curious. pass around Is that in charts. this bigger thing? Yes, I think so. Or it's in it's these. It's in I this. Think oh, here it is. Yeah, yeah. That yes. kind of outlines the details right. of every other state. So if you program. could maybe, if we could. You know. also have a chart that Joyce Manchester prepared. Okay. I guess someone updated it. Oh, program, great. So. Okay. That should be in the fiscal note. Mm -hmm. So. Which we don't have, I don't think. Okay, Could and be. the chart's been updated too um, with the new Washington state law. It, it's updated I, February 18th? No, there's a new one that was updated March 20th. Oh, which great. I'm sure the committee gets uh, later today. I'll send it to Kayla. So, so and does Kayla have the fiscal note from, from Do you Joyce? Have that? Okay. I can check. It'd be great. And if we don't, because I'm not sure I see it here, I just. Mm -hmm. I brought oh yes, we do. We do. We got uh, the joint fiscal office fiscal okay. up here, but it's a year old. Okay. Was it there, in the? Do we have a? Would you, Kayla, would you be kind enough to ask Joyce if we have an updated fiscal note? Mm -hmm. Because this the one was, we have on this is from April of seventeen. This was from when it passed Ways and Means, so I I don't yeah I don't imagine think anything would have changed since then. Updated. The only thing that was updated was the comparison chart. Yeah. Because Washington yeah. State passed a new law mm -hmm. uh, yeah. after we adjourned last year. Uh, and then what happened? So, so that in or, March, by March of this year, that the changed from February. Uh, so the. What we noticed going back over it was that uh, some of the boxes hadn't been correctly updated. Okay. And so, so we just corrected. The March 2018 is the most of today. Yeah, right. some of the boxes uh, reflected out of date uh, the old Washington state law, which was never implemented. And uh, Kayla, why, if, if you'd be kind enough to also ask Joyce if there was a fiscal note prepared of the House uh, general version, it would be interesting to compare the two uh, fiscal notes. There's a draft fiscal note that might be on the House General Web page. I can send you the link. Great, thanks. So. And I do have one here if anyone wants to. Look at it. Yeah, we have the one oh, okay. uh, from April 17th. Some ways and means. Um, so the last two things I'll note um, intermittently, we would strongly recommend that this. It's not specified whether or not this would be permitted, so I presume that it wouldn't be under the current draft. But we, this is particularly um, important for people taking leave for caregiving or for their own illness or injury. Um, if people are splitting up the caregiving um, responsibilities with an aging parent, with other family members, maybe their shift is on a Friday, and so it makes sense for them to take leave um, for this through this program. But they only would need it for you know a Friday for 12 weeks, um, and so this is something that is permitted in undercurrent law and we would recommend that it's, it's silent to this bill though? Yes, it's not specified. How about it's... breaking it up in more traditional ways like three weeks and three weeks? Is that a specifically allowed for the bill? In in the current bill it's not specified. So we can it's do silent. what we want. Yeah. Yes. So it's silent yeah. But I think the key is flexibility here. Right. Intermittent leave, you know, it needs to be flexible for mm -hmm. to maybe be designed between employee and employer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would uh, say that the bill does provide for in intermittent leave. Oh, it it's does specify. On. Doesn't specify. Okay. It. So it could be called out specifically. Good. Okay. That's um, what I was. The, yeah, it doesn't specify. You're okay. correct. 
but the existing law uh, isn't clear on that either, and it's been interpreted to allow for intermittent leave. Um, so, like for example, if you had chemotherapy and had to take mm -hmm. uh, treatment under your your um, your medical leave there, you could take you know two days and then two days and then two days right. for each treatment, um, something and like that, that. Is that based on federal law interpretation? I'm sure there's a lot of that from the late cases. Yes, yeah. okay. there's uh, federal law guidance and interpretation on that um, from the FMLA, and then our law generally follows the interpretation there. Right. Okay. Great. And then the last piece is the funding mechanism. So as I said before, we were in full support of the bill as it was introduced with joint funding. I'd like to clarify that um, sometimes I've been hearing that the perception is that because it got changed to employee only funding it was because of business opposition and that's not the case um, we brought in a number of business owners in support we've heard support from members from businesses across the state um, and there was actually very few opposing testimonies um, in the house and so it was just a policy decision that was made by the house and so I like to just stress that we were in support of it we're also in support of the bill under the current funding mechanism as well and so we don't you know necessarily have a recommendation for what you all do but I just wanted you to have all the information from us when you make a decision um, and then I just thought it was important to note that most of our members do not provide this benefit some do and for those that offer 12 week paid parental leave benefit um, at 100% wage replacement most of them have said that if this policy were, if this program were created in the state, that they would, if it were employee funded, they would pay for that cost. And then if the program is less generous than their original policy, then they would just simply supplement it to make up for the extra number of weeks or wage replacement level. Um, Was there any talk about mandating that? Mandating it in what way? That people who provide generous benefits now don't race to the bottom. Uh, this is a pretty small program at this point. Right. Uh, I, I, you know, I fear that you can have some employers who say, well, this is now state policy, so I could save a lot of money here and just cut this benefit down to this, this policy that the state legislature has come up with. Yeah, I haven't heard that because most of the businesses that we work with who do provide it, they're doing it on their own because it's something they can afford and it's something that they believe in. And so um, if they're already paying this significant cost to offer 12-week benefit, if the state were to create this program um, and they were to supplement it, it would generally be less expensive than their current policy. And so they don't. there's no really incentive for them to erode the benefit that they were voluntarily offering. Um, that's at least been our perspective and our experience with our members. Was there any discussion at all about exempting out businesses that already provide better provisions? I think there wasn't discussion amongst um, our that? members. You yeah, I think well, you it's been a question. You don't have to contribute to this payroll if you're providing a better one, then leave it to enforcement mechanisms. Yeah, we do that on other things. Uh, yeah, I think that this is a conversation that's come up in other states. Um, and we, the, my, and maybe Damien can step in too if, if he has anything to add, but um, I've heard that the main reason for not doing that is because it would exempt, um, you know, if we're having this statewide insurance pool, the more people that you exempt, the more expensive the cost becomes. Um, and uh, like healthy teenagers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so um, it doesn't really necessarily make sense from our perspective to exempt them instead just include them in the program and then if the program's less generous than their policy then they can supplement it which i'm hearing that they would do the uh the only state that i can that i'm sure allows for employers to provide their own is california i think new jersey may as well but we're talking two economies that are yeah you know, significantly right different size than mm -hmm. uh vermont here and there they have to show that it's substantively equal or, or better benefits um, from the employer, and I can put together a briefing for the committee on, on those provisions if you'd like. I would like to see that, yeah. Okay. In there. Um, and so, just to wrap up these, I just want to reiterate that 
we are in full support of paid family leave. Um, the pieces that I just laid out were just to try to give you a sense of what we as an organization would like to see ideally. In an ideal world, be in the program as the policy is passed, recognizing that you know it's a big challenge because there were significant things carved out in the house. And so, um, but we hope that you know this was helpful and. If you have any questions that we can help with, I'd be happy to share any information and connect you to anyone. Um, I, for example, I talk to the, the administrators of the Rhode Island program often about how their program works, and so I'm sure they would be happy to come and testify if you have questions for them. And So happy to take any other sure, questions. Question. So I have a question, um, and, and maybe this is an answer <coughs> in your chart, which is the uptake the rate of uptake, mm -hmm. because I think all of us are, you know, even for those of us who support it, and I, I pretty fully support this having a good sponsor of it, um, the up, you know, how much is it actually used? And I would love to hear uh, from employers and employees, but mm -hmm. obviously employees, it's a, a hopefully a good experience, but it would be very interesting to hear from an employer, uh, how it's working for them in a state that uh, has been doing it for some time. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to know the uptake and uh, the use of it, and it would be great to hear from an employer out of state. Okay, great. And there are um, there are some research studies. I'm thinking particularly of California about just overall employer perceptions of the program, um, which have been favorable. But I can see. I'll talk to some of our national partners and see if they have connections to businesses. Because the only one that looks like it's been in place for any length of time is California. Yeah. So it would be great to find an employer in California where it's a, it's now part of the fabric of employment mm -hmm. and, um, and assume things. It's, it's been regularized. Yeah. And so it would be really good to hear from a state and employer in that in California that, yeah. you, you know, where it's just become normal. Right. Mm -hmm. And how it's used. <clears throat> So the, um, the general committee upstairs took out the, the joint funding mm -hmm. for the Yes. And, but you say you don't think it was a response to the business community? You think it was just... No, I, mean, I think, I mean, I would, again, defer to them to explain exactly the rationale behind it, but my perception is that it was a decision made perhaps to, in thinking that it would be more likely to move through the, the House, but I would defer to the committee to, to state exactly why they made that change. Um, not that I'm going to hold you to this, but of, in the House pass version, you've got all these variables. Mm -hmm. Which are the two most important to you? So this is such a tough answer, and I was thinking about this last night and how I would answer this question. I think that the, so I'll say that the Family Leave Coalition, we talked about this two weeks ago about if we had to make some decisions about this or that, what would we want? And we decided that um, we think that having a shorter length of leave but a more robust benefit would be more important. So six weeks that includes medical leave that has less restrictive eligibility that keeps the wage replacement like it is now um, would be more important than having a 12-week benefit that doesn't include medical leave that's restrictive. Um, I think that the, the two biggest things, I think the medical leave is probably the top, the most important thing. Um, and then medical, just yeah, medical yeah, leave for yourself. Yeah, Take medical yourself. leave. Yeah, yeah medical yeah. leave or temporary disability insurance. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the most important one. Okay. So, um, so the I think the last time people were in, or I don't know, were staying in, the cost of this program dropped precipitously. Mm -hmm. uh, from, I guess, the General Committee's version to the Ways and Means Committee version, and the primary driver of that was getting rid of medical leave, right? 
I, I believe it was getting rid of medical leave and then dropping the weeks from um, 12 to 6. Where the, I believe those were the two main cost factors. I don't know, Damien, if you know that off the top of your head. Um, but then also changing the wage replacement and the eligibility also changed. The yeah, there, were, well. there were a number of factors that kind of yeah. drove that. Um, I can okay. outline those for you, okay. too. Allison, I'm, I've been told that you have a meeting at 11. Just what I was just telling her. Uh, you do. Okay. Uh, I have no idea. In the pro temp's office. I understand. Okay. So. So I understand. We'll, we'll take a. In uh, we'll take a 15, stereo. fifteen minute break, given that we're down to three people at this point. <laughs> do you have anything you want to add? Um, no, nothing else to add. But definitely think of me as a resource if you need information or need okay. me to connect you to anyone for the committee for the testimony. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> the bill as That's close short as they did. Stick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see a big hill and I climb it, you know? So um, but I appreciate the opportunity to weigh in here. And, and in fact, we concur with a lot of what Main Street Alliance said. Uh, I'd like to initially talk about how the United States is kind of an outlier in, in this area. 80% uh, of countries have established family and medical leave programs. Uh, of those countries, only three uh, are unpaid, and that's the United States, Ethiopia, and Australia. Um, and um, you know, Australia, I, even. I was. I'm not quite yeah. sure why um, uh, there. Yeah, and I know um, establishing this on the federal level was a goal of the Obama administration. Unfortunately, not uh, realized, and that kind of you know creates a, a patchwork system <laughs> among the states of different um, um, paid and unpaid family leave programs. Um, but we can look at the states that have um, these programs already existing and see the, uh, the results from several years of data. And you know, the number one takeaway was that more workers take time off, uh, including low-income parents who uh, otherwise probably would have dropped out of the workforce um, uh, altogether. Um, additionally, when these folks return to the workforce uh, with, with, you know, that they have paid family leave, uh, they return to the workforce and they work more hours and they're going to get higher pay additionally. Um, for the businesses, you know, what we found in other states that have done this is that the traditional business community, you know, raises a lot of concerns around these uh, programs. Um, uh, but it, the, uh, the final result was um, kind of much ado about nothing when it comes to uh, the impact on the business bottom line. In fact, they'll see, you know, um, employees stay longer with the, uh, with the businesses, lower turnover rates, which we know for a business, replacing a worker is a very expensive and time consuming. Um, so there are kind of some ancillary impacts on, on business that you can see as a benefit, but um, for the, many of these businesses in the other states that have done this, there is no negative economic impact that um, we've been able to find. Um, and I wanted to, to hit upon two suggested changes, with which Ashley also uh, talked about. Uh, number one, the funding mechanism. Um, you know, as a policy, BBSR uh, supports uh, shared equity for a program like this. We think both the employer and the employee ideally should be paying in. Um, that said, we are comfortable with the House version, um, but if this is something the committee wants to explore, we'd be happy to be at the table talking about that. Um, additionally, um, you know, Ashley talked about um, the, the business size in there, the metric, and we, uh, we also find that uh, the number of employees a company has really doesn't tell you anything about that business. Uh, I have, you know, some businesses that have six employees and um, very high salaries, you know, that could have, that do, can't can afford a program like this. Um, so we think uh, when it comes to uh, the job security issue that that metric should be dropped. And I know uh, the chair has, uh, I think, a, a different proposal uh, in, in your own bill, which we would also be comfortable with as well. Um, but I wanted to also briefly speak personally about this issue uh, and how this would impact VBSR. You know, we are a small nonprofit, six full-time employees, a handful of part-timers, been around for 28 years. We have a great benefit package. You know, VBSR pays 90% of my uh, health insurance premium. I have more time off when, you know, you folks aren't here than I know what to do with. Uh, honestly, and uh, this is something we have struggled with uh, over the past few years, trying to figure out how to implement, you know, as a small employer. And uh, over the past few years, especially as we've grown as an organization, uh, we generally have a younger workforce now than we did maybe 10 years ago. And uh, there was an incident about a year and a half ago where two of our employees were having their kid, having their first child. Um, and uh, suddenly they were asking about what our paid leave program was, and we didn't really have anything set up. 
and we've talked to our members, looked at other um, uh, other programs and how other members are making it work, and we just can't make the finances work right now uh, as, a, as a single nonprofit. Um, so this is something we are particularly interested in uh, to create a baseline uh, benefit for you know all employers and all employees, um, so we can begin you know uh, taking care of our employees the way we want to. So VBSO doesn't have a, a paid family benefit presently. We don't. No. And in fact, they don't even fall under the FMLA law. Um, employees. I think actually we just um, was we just hired um, up. And we will now be hitting that benchmark, and we're looking at how that uh, changes. In fact, we also hit the benchmark in the in the in Vermont's paid sick days law as well, and we'll be implementing that as well. We already had an existing program with paid sick days, but we uh, we hit that that level of employees. So, is ten the magic number with paid sick days too? No, I think it, was, I think it, it, it might five, be five, four, five, three. I thought it was higher than that. So. Have to no, be. The campion, the, fame, the infamous campion amendment was five, I think. Right, okay. Right, I don't know what they want. It's all, uh, I, I better look before I misstate this. Uh, this shows you what happens to uh, bills I work on after I stop working on them. I don't think I was here for that. So I mean, again, as a you know a small small employer, this is a benefit our employees are asking for. They need it. Um, and we are currently not in a position to offer something like this. So that's one of the reasons we do support this legislation. Um, so we can you know, we take care of our employees the way we really want to and make sure that they get the time off that they need either with a you know, family member so, or a child. So just to play devil's advocate yeah. here, if you, when the bill came um, out of the uh, general committee, my understanding was there was no small business exemption and you were, um, you would have been covered by the law as it came out of the general. Are you saying you couldn't afford to do it on your own, but you still would have welcomed the law because it's a shared pool in the funds? Is that the distinction you're making? Yes, yeah. As a small employer, we could not do this alone. Uh, and that's why we think you know there needs to be a law here okay. uh, to enable us and other employers of our size to offer this. Okay. Okay. So this is a pro small business. Bill. Absolutely, yes. You know our employers, you know, know when um, their uh, employees are rested and they know their families taken care of and they've had time off. They come to work and they're they're better workers. They're more productive. Um, they're more invested in the organization. Do you have other points? That's, uh, that wraps up my testimony, and I haven't submitted it yet, but I'll be doing that later this morning. So, Can you talk just a, a bit about, there's a couple other things. I was, I was out of the room, and I don't know how deep the committee went, but I think the bill that passed the House, even though it's a fairly modest proposal, even compared to other states, I think in terms of the breadth of the coverage, it is probably larger than most other states you know, dealing with brothers and sisters and grandparents and you know not necessarily the nuclear family uh, that's my assessment but I would probably defer to Main Street Alliance um, on that since they followed the, the bill closely in the house so I know that the bill as is um, compared to other states does is a little more generous in, in the um, reimbursement for time off. I believe it's 80% of the current bill, and a lot of the states we looked at was around 60%. And we think 80% is appropriate. You know, at 60%, um, it's really kind of hard to cobble together, you know, um, your lifestyle, even for a few weeks. So how do you address, and I should have asked Ashley this, how do you address the fact that poor employment loss, like when you're fired when you're laid off from work or when you get injured on the job doesn't pay nearly as much as this benefit does. Um, yeah, that's um, very true. You know, I, I speak personally, uh, my brother-in-law uh, had a very serious injury at work. You know, he's the sole breadwinner for the family, uh, has a wife and young child, and he's on workers' comp and, and really struggling to make ends meet. They're already struggling. 
and I think workers' comp is around um, to search. Yeah, and then he finds out that additionally, because he's um, uh, they're losing money on their uh, food stamps as well because of um, of the money he's getting from workers' comp. So um, it's a real struggle for for low income families. So this is a much better be benefit. Yes. So could you hypothesize if that's the right word? why someone is deserving of a higher benefit because of an illness that being laid off from work or um, or being laid off you're laid off from work or having an injury on the job um, that as an organization that's something we haven't discussed so I would be speculating right now um, but um, that's something that we should look into you know Okay. So, so to that, any questions? Yes. Yeah. To that yeah. point, are you able to collect both? Collect both. Workers' comp and paid family leave. Boy, that's a. Uh, that's a question we should ask Damien. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that. I'm sorry. Yes. Well, workers' comp now is not. Workers' comp is an injury to the worker, and the worker is not covered anymore in the house right. pass version. So, that's probably the point right mm -hmm. now. But when it came out. Uh, I would assume that most laws like this are written that it's weird. You probably go to workers' comp first, and then this second, and then you would be you should be getting hurt by going to a lesser benefit. Yeah, this this disqualifies you from collecting unemployment. Um, it does. Yes, uh, you can't fall, collect yeah. unemployment yeah. while you're collecting this benefit um, because you could leave your job. And still collect this benefit if you meet the eligibility requirements, um, so or you could have be laid off right before you have the baby, and then still collect these benefits if you meet eligibility. But you can't can't collect unemployment uh, during that time. I need to double check on the. Um, Is that the workers' compensation? And these are taxable benefits, right? These are taxable benefits. Um, it is a little more complicated than that. They're taxable depending on how you file your taxes. You may be able to make a deduction for your contributions. Can't um, you do it? Can't you make this contribution pre-tax? No. This is the. Wow. So wait, hold on. The the contribution is deductible. So it's a deductible contribution. The benefit itself is taxable. So the way it works. Uh, is if you itemize deductions, which nobody you, do, nobody will anymore. But go ahead. Right. Um, so this was we did this analysis under the old tax law. But if you itemize deductions, you would deduct your contributions. If you don't itemize deductions, the amount over what you contributed is taxed. Um, so if you only collected a hundred dollars in benefits, but you paid in two hundred, you wouldn't owe taxes. But if you collected a thousand dollars in benefits and you only paid in two hundred, then you would owe taxes on the eight hundred dollars. Um, and these are round numbers with above and beyond what you contributed. <coughs> right. You'd be taxed. Right. So you're taxed on anything above and beyond what you contributed. Um, and so this is a little bit different than unemployment uh, compensation, even though it's treated for taxing purposes like unemployment compensation because the employee is making contributions, whereas for unemployment, the employer makes all the contributions. So um, it, it gets a little bit complicated in there. So is unemployment benefits taxable right now? Yes. Are, are workers' comp benefits taxable? No. And that's What's the, the difference? I mean, what's? The difference is there's two sections of federal law and then a series of um, federal IRS opinions that have set out that workers' comp benefits are treated differently than unemployment benefits. Uh, I can get back to the committee with the citations to the federal law that separates them out. The, from the IRS's standpoint, uh, benefits, the temporary disability insurance benefits that uh, uh, Ashley was talking about right. that were taken out of this bill, right. those are not taxable benefits. Uh, the, family leave and bonding right. benefits are taxable benefits. So the IRS has made this distinction that own disability is treated like workers' comp because you're unable to work. Uh, family bonding leave 
and uh, leave following a, a birth of a child uh, is treated as if it's unemployment. I mean, family care, not family, family care. I mean, so yes, yeah, so this is family care. Die, I mean, like right, family care, bonding with a new child, or post birth, uh, if you're the mother, um, that's all treated as if uh, as if you're just un receiving unemployment. So just benefits. just so the committee's clear, um, unemployment benefits are taxable by the federal government, and we've had several bills that have not made it the distance here to not tax them on them. the state level. And right. most states don't tax unemployment mm -hmm. bill, unemployment benefit. Sort of like what we're talking about with Social Security in some ways, exempting out from state taxation, unemployment, uh, Social Security benefits. But I'd be interested, I mean, I, I, you know, one of the things that I would like to understand a little better is if we can make these benefits non-taxable, it seems to me that that, well, if we, Certainly, if employers were contributing anything, it would make their share a little bit less because we exactly. could take we could take the eighty percent down somewhat and have it made up by them not being taxable. So I'd like to understand that a little bit. Better. Right. So to the extent that uh, their the sort of family care, family leave bonding uh, benefits, we won't be able to get them out from. Uh, federal, taxation. federal taxation, we could expressly exempt them from state taxation. But, but I wouldn't want to reduce the 80%. I would rather work closer to the 100% rather than reduce 80%. I'd rather. Yeah, and do, so. Do we know it? Yeah, the, it should be noted that with the 80%, uh, there. The, the 80% is, sure is, is not subject to the. the other payroll taxes, the Social Security and Medicare, so it does become a little bit uh, larger portion um, because normally that would come out of the employee's wages. Uh, so about 7.6% or something like that comes out of the employee's wages. Um, and so that's not there in this bill. What is there is income tax. So if you took out the state income tax, you'd add a few more percentage points back. Uh, there, the alternative is to raise the benefit, um, and it's just it depends on whether you want to burden the fund for the program okay. or reduce general fund receipts. Okay. Um, Could you just do a, a a graph or a memo of workers' comp unemployment, these benefits, choice, and, what, and yeah. we put the disability thing back in, you know, how they all get taxed? If yeah. maybe Joyce could. Yeah. So tax, I've got a chart showing the taxation breakdown, which okay. I'll give to you. Okay, great. Um, and then I'll ask Joyce about projecting numbers on okay. adding it back in. Yes. So while we're on this subject, um, and I haven't, maybe it's explained in the bill, but as we do this side by side substantive changes, the, the as passed, has the uh, has this funded by a 0.141% payroll paid by default by employees and the employer with an option to contribute. So what is the, uh, to me that is an option to contribute. You can't quantify that. How are we quantifying that contribution? The, the employer may cover the employees, the amount of contribution due from the employee. But so, can't put more in in this system, they can give added benefits on their own, but they can't like send more money to the fund, right? Right, yeah, so there's there's no Could provision they match for them it? to- Was there no provision? I mean, because to me, it, it, it's, you, it's very hard to do a fiscal note when you, it, would it be the same amount or would they match it so it could be more? Yes, so the- Because you have it being met, it's it, much more generous in the house version. If you look at the verding, or the wording, excuse me, in the um, in the the version that passed from the House, uh, what you have is it basically says an employer may pay some or all of the employee's contribution on behalf of the employee, which so is now nine times smaller roughly than it was before when it left the House general. Right, and that's because the eligibility and benefit amount uh, and covered conditions all changed in House Ways and Means. 
But if we take the coverage condition up to including own illness again, we're going to have to raise the amount. Yes. Got it. Yes, if you include own illness, you'll need to raise the amount. If you right. increase the number of weeks or the eligibility of the employees, you'll have to uh, increase that contribution amount. That's designed to cover uh, this minimal amount that right they pass. those conditions uh, and that specific level of eligibility working 12 out of the last 13 months in Vermont. Um, okay, so all those pieces are in interplay, and, and we can, I guess, chat about that with Joyce because I'd love to know what it would have to take it up to. to right, so we'll if, get to. Um, okay. I'll, maybe I'll catch up with you offline and just get some specific scenarios you'd like model just because she's going to need yeah she's going to need directions from us to, Michael on what we want to see model to do that but, okay so uh, I guess I have one other question and then we'll adjourn on this topic uh, we'll have some committee discussion on some other stuff but I just I want to ask you is um, can you tell us in terms of your office you follow this bill in the house I assume yes who are who's opposing or expressing concerns around the bill because I don't see either chamber in the room and I'm just concerned. I think there was some, might have been some scheduling conflicts. Um, right, but usually they have but, backup to sit in and take notes or something like that. Yeah, um, or for the record, just as a good uh, engineer for the Department of Labor. Um, I think you should, I, I think there were scheduling conflicts. Um, I think there have been some staff changes as well. That's okay. just my so perception. So, who, in terms of, I mean, it's, I don't feel necessarily it should be my job to solicit testimony. I think people should be asking us. They want to come and testify. But that aside, who do you think we should be hearing from? I mean, word is the governor has big concerns with this bill, and I assume that there's people who have expressed concern to the governor. Who should we be hearing from? Um, as far from the administration, I think we, the Department of Labor can definitely no, speak to that. No, 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 I would, the Vermont Chamber of Commerce, a AIB, I think they're usual okay. kind of suspects. I think that's, okay. would be my and then nation. Department of Labor and ACCD, I would think, would all want to be weighing in on this. So the Department of Labor can definitely, we're obviously named in the bill as the creator and the administrator of the program, so we can definitely speak to the administration and to the fiscal note that we're working on to create. Well, we're for delighted to have you in the room. Thank okay. you. It's the only representative well, of the administration. Thank you all for coming in. Um, you may be of interest in the next area of conversation I want to have. I saw Becca sh nodding her head, but I, you know, we'll include her. But I was thinking that this might be worthy of a public hearing. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, I want to know the committee's thoughts on that. Was there any kind of public hearing on this issue in the state of yeah, you know, last year or this year? No. I think it would be great to do a public hearing. I concur. I'd like to see the list of the groups that are supportive because people could keep talking about a big alliance here and I'd like to get a sense of uh, who's supportive of this. And we just started talking about Ashley's whether we should we should set up aside at like 90 minutes for or two hours for a public hearing maybe next week on this issue. <laughs> I uh, I'm not sure I would be able to commit. You're talking about night. Like five, or we could do. Um, we could work around your schedule. Five as to well. seven. <laughs> but the other thing is, we have um, been asked to think about uh, uh, caucuses starting next week. So when it gets into multiple evenings, right. it's very tough. I can't say I don't see anything else on our agenda that would require a public hearing. But this is sort of a, yep. I've heard a lot of support and need, I and mean, we haven't heard the examples yet uh, from individuals, um, but it does seem like a sort of a, a populist grassroots kind of thing that you might learn something. But, I, you know, I, I would respect your, if you couldn't make it, we yeah. would go with four, but if you 
I would that aside, I would. I mean, if you want to just start at four, I could adjourn Ed at four and be there from or, four to or six, 30. and that would be fine. I, I guess I'm more whether or not you could be there. Could I want to know your thoughts about the concept? Well, to to be honest, I think if you hold a public hearing on this, um, you'll wind up hearing from people who are activated specifically to come by the advocacy groups, and they can come in as witnesses in that way. I doubt people would hear an advertised meeting and show up for this topic. I could be wrong. Um, but well, I'm actually know. also thinking small businesses, yep. and them coming in and hearing what their concerns are, individual small businesses. Because I'm looking at this bill at this point, and you know, I'm not saying we're going to go with the house version, but it doesn't cost them right. anything. It doesn't give them any more people any more job security than they had before. You know, I'm, I'm struggling to see where the business that, community has problems with this bill. Well, that's what I mean. I don't, I don't think you'd get a spontaneous outpouring of business people or um, you know rank and file workers. I think you'd wind up getting people who are lined up to be witnesses for that public hearing, and um, you know that that is also useful. I just think that it wouldn't differ so much from the testimony we would hear. Yeah, well, I, I you know I have to say I've gotten a couple of irate businesses on minimum wage that have said you didn't hear from the public. We did. Uh, I know we did. <laughs> I know it is. Just having you think about yeah, it. Right. Yeah, exactly. We think that, you know, I, I don't want to be caught in that situation. I, I think it would be great to do a public hearing because, I, I mean, I thought the public hearing for minimum wage was very illuminating for me, not, uh, in, in, I think mostly with the youth and actually the unorganized. There weren't, I didn't feel that it was a heavily organized uh, uh, effort, but I mean, I may be wrong. Uh, but I, I thought it was. I was very compelled by that public hearing. Um, well, I thought it was useful. However, we didn't really hear from many businesses. Yeah, which was public. surprising. So, uh, I was. No, I agree with you. I mean, 38 testified, and 35 individuals, and three businesses all right. against. And I'd like to see a more balanced approach. Um, yes. If we do a public hearing here, I would want to hear from a lot of small businesses and from individuals both for people who both had the opportunity. And in committee, I'd like to hear, but as I said. you can control that with who we have in here. You can't yeah. control it at a public hearing. You could wind up with another. Um, and I think, honestly, you would. You, you probably have you know, six to one advocates for the bill at, at a public hearing. So it sounds like what you're interested in is hearing people who have concerns. I, I think the better way to address that might be to begin scheduling them, putting out the word, scheduling them heavier into our agenda here. Yeah, and I, 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 this will segue into uh, the next conversation. Um, we've got some real time constraints at this point. Especially someone said that we don't have, I think it was David who said we only have three more weeks and we have 22 bills. Uh, it's going to be at uh, this one. If you we get from everybody on committee, it could take quite a lot of time. All right, I'll take that all that under advisement. Let's move on to that list that I sent out. I just want to try to be fair in quantity. Like copy I did. I have a copy so right here, yeah. except it, it did print it very strangely. Well, I think the initials are more important than the copies are. Yeah, right. Hold on, I just got to find that just right here. It, it, it just misses the people. It, it printed way too big, and I, maybe she has a better copy of it, but okay, well, here's copy mine. It just printed. Could you put there for people? But um, also, I wouldn't want to do a public hearing until we're sure about what we want in this bill. And I would do a public hearing once we have chosen what we decided to do. Because it's definitely a classic chicken egg. Yeah. You have to decide if you want to do it before we hear from the people. Oh, I, I think it's hand in glove. I mean, I'd love to continue hearing from people during the course of our uh, deliberations in committee. But in some ways, it's uh, odd to have a 
well, we could ask questions too, but if we wanted to change something as fundamental in the bill as the uh, including one's own illness or injury, I, you know, to have them commenting on the bill as passed by the House isn't necessarily what we would want to be passing. So I'd want to have them be commenting on what we wanted to propose rather than something we weren't wedded to. Right. Um, just got an email that Dennis LeBounty would like to testify on <laughs> H196 and he's standing there. Are you prepared to testify right now? Yeah, I might as well. <laughs> how, did you, how did you send that email up. by standing in the corner? I'm sorry? How did you do that by standing no, in the corner? No. She broke Kayla somehow. It's impressive. <laughs> so while we're getting that printed up, let's, let's uh, hear from Dennis. Uh, Welcome, Dennis. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Chair and uh, Committee, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Dennis LeBounty. I'm with the Vermont AFL-CIO. Uh, we wholeheartedly support the bill, with the exception of we need to uh, shrink the eligibility from uh, 12, you have to work 12 months out of the 13 to work at least like six months to, out of the 12 because we have a number of uh, employers that are seasonal employ employers have, and uh, this would eliminate them to be eligible but in the same time they still have to pay into the program but they wouldn't be able to receive the benefit of the program. So uh, we definitely want to see the eligibility rate. So go back to the House uh, yeah. general version. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, Could you give me an example of, of one that works? So well, we have. Uh, so you, mean, you mean that these people could never be eligible because they work like right. eight months of the year or something? Yes, like that? that's correct. Because you have to work 12 months out of the 13. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just, I just, you know, I know you wanted to hear some stories, and I have a couple of stories. Uh, one, usually do. <laughs> and um, uh, one of them is uh, childbirth. Now, being a father, as many of you were, uh, still after, it after, doesn't go away. Okay, well, <laughs> after, after, after having a child, uh, you know, going to work, and you think about, you know, your child, you can't wait to get home, you know, to see your child, and so forth and so on. And, and I can't imagine what it's like for a mother uh, to be able to, not to be able to stay home with their child at you know, any length of time um, because they couldn't afford to, to stay home. I mean, some of them, if they're able to, you know, go back to work in you know, two weeks after, after childbirth. And I think it's critically important that they have time to bond. And uh, I think you know, not only you know, socially, but economically, that's the best, best thing to do. Um, my other story is really quickly, um, my wife's mother had ALS uh, about two and a half years ago. Uh, my wife was working two part-time jobs. Um, she, we were in a position, fortunately, that she was able to quit one of her part-time jobs so that she could be at home and take care of her mother. Um, she was, at first, you know, she was there for a couple hours a day, but as the disease progressed, uh, she needed more care and more care. So eventually she was there uh, pretty much from uh, 8 in the morning until almost 7 o'clock at night. Uh, with an hour and a half break so she could do her, because she's a school bus driver, so she could do her busing in the afternoon. And almost every day, her mother would say, I am so glad you're here, because, you know, she, she didn't want to go into a nursing home, and my wife definitely didn't want to put her into a nursing home. Not that the nursing homes are, you know, that, that we need them, but um, I think it comforted her mother immensely by having her daughter there to be able to take care of her. And her father, who was 87 years old at the time, legally blind, and, and he had, of course, he couldn't be able to you know, lift her up. And you know, everything else that goes with taking care of an individual you know, that has ALS in, 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 the, in the last couple of months of, uh, of, their, of their stages. So um, you know, again, as I'm saying, you know, we were able to uh, get along without you know, the extra job. And um, I just think that there's many other people it'd be wonderful if that they would have the same opportunity to be able to take care of a loved one like that. Um, not only is it gives it peace of mind to the individual that is down the road is gonna be passing, but it also gives the, the family member uh, closure and comfort uh, to be there, not having to worry about, you know, how their parent or their loved one is doing. 
uh, by working on the job and um, having having that in the back of their mind. And I think uh, Senator Bruce uh, uh, mentioned it earlier that um, you know the you know not to have them to not having this way on their mind. Um, you know they become better workers, more productive workers when they come back to work. And uh, so, anyways, I I, I think that's it's, it's extremely important. Um, I, as you heard from uh, Dan Barlow, uh, you know, there's only a, 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 a three uh, countries out there that doesn't have paid family leave that have you know the industrialized world. And uh, and I think it's a shame that you know we don't have it for for our for our people. And I think it's you know a minimal cost. Um, I look at it like an insurance policy, and uh, I think this is something that we definitely need to strive to do. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. How long was your wife attending her mother? How long? Well, she was. Uh, well, she started in February, uh, and and she you know she needed some care, but not quite as much. And then, of course, as it as it progressed, I would say when she was there. On like full time, it was, it, it was probably three months. Okay. Yeah, when she was there, you know, every, you know, so that almost all that. All her entire leave. Yeah. Much. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have five minutes. Um, so I think this list is self explanatory. I tried to be as sensitive to people's needs and times and stuff. So just throw it out there for discussion if anybody has any problems and want to jump on a bill or get out of a bill and you know this is somewhat unusual to sort of assign leadership of a bill but I think it makes sense because as opposed to being asked to, mm -hmm. to report a bill and then you weren't paying all that much attention or you know it, it, it's, it's, it's a I good thought thing. it worked before Crossroads yeah. pretty well. So, and, and, it, and, the, and, the, and the things can change depending upon people's choices, and we're not going to get to everyone probably either. I have a question about that weatherization program, 831. Uh, yes. Why is that us instead of natural resources? Or finance for that matter? Um, well, it, I think it's, it's a huge e economic Did you work on that growth of jobs. I mean, no, it's it's an economic growth it's a byproduct, really. We're not we're not doing this to create jobs. We're doing it for the energy. I think this is like isn't it like the thing they? It may be like what they did with the fuel dealers, and we we dealt with that last year yeah. in the economic development bill. It's a it's a way to uh, get people employed. If I yeah, accelerate a program, I think, I it's think an employment issue. I, I I guess the only thing I would say is. Might not be a bad idea um, for you to ha have me run it by Chris um, and see if we want to get rid of it. Well, because if he if he wants it or he's going to take it in anyway, but we, we might as well just give but, it to him. But we might actually act faster. On that. Yeah, well, not with all these so bills. So went through general housing and military affairs. Right. Okay. And the uh, staff on it is Rebecca Wasserman. She's the attorney staff again. Okay. So maybe we could. We'll look into it. Okay. Because we haven't heard about it yet either. Yeah, I don't even know what it, what it does. But so it, it so. would be great to hear about it and see if it's appropriate. But yeah. my guess is we will act more. Yeah, I, right. I don't think I don't think many committees have as many bills as warning committees as we do. And so, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. If if we've got so many, right. if there's one that Chris wants to take in anyway, great. we might as well let him do the spade work. Okay. Anything else? Uh, is it okay? I mean. Yeah, yes, no, I, I think it's good. Then we all know what we're shepherding through. Okay, good. Thank you very much. <coughs> we'll check out that.